Since its debut on HBO in 2011, Game of Thrones has become a cultural phenomenon, gaining fans worldwide, including presidents and prime ministers. Controversial and addictive, Game of Thrones is one of the most talked about and well-known shows in the world. Think you know everything there is to know about the world of Westeros? Think again. I'm Rob Bradford, and I'm here to bring you Cinematica's 107 Facts You Should Know About Game of Thrones Season 1. Let's get started. Number 1. Game of Thrones is adapted from the series of books called A Song of Ice and Fire, George R. R. Martin's super popular fantasy novels, the first of which is entitled A Game of Thrones. Number two, George R. R. Martin was known for writing difficult to film scripts for film and television and was so disillusioned with the process, he's actually quoted as saying he wrote Game of Thrones to be unfilmable. Seems like he was right and HBO is the only network that could pull it off. Number three, according to David Benioff and D.B. Weiss, the creators of the HBO series, they started trying to get the books adapted in 2006 after falling in love with the first book. Weiss even claims he finished the thousand page novel in quote maybe 36 hours. Number four. Prior to Game of Thrones, Benioff was best known for adapting his novel 25th Hour for Spike Lee's brooding post 9-11 drama starring Edward Norton and Philip Seymour Hoffman. Not a bad pedigree. Number five. They successfully pitched the series to HBO and even convinced George R.R. R. Martin, a veteran screenwriter himself, in the course of a five hour meeting in a restaurant to agree to the idea. Benioff recalled they won Martin over with their answer to his question, who is Jon Snow? mother. Spoiler alert people, we think R plus L equals J. Number six, it took four years to bring Game of Thrones to your TV. HBO started developing the series in 2007, but the process of adapting the stories, casting the show, and actually producing the enormous pilot took forever. Number seven, George R. R. Martin actually writes one episode every season. In season one, he wrote The Pointy End, which is a reference to the sword fighting lesson Jon Snow gave Arya before leaving for the wall. Number eight, the first season is a near completely faithful adaptation of the novel. It's certainly the closest the series ever stayed to the original material. Number nine, most fantasy novels have a vaguely British medieval look and feel, but did you know the principal inspiration for Game of Thrones look and feel is really specific? Martin had suggested the English War of the Roses between the houses of Lancaster and York are reflected in the houses of Lannister and Stark. Number 10, believe it or not, George R.R. R. Martin also credits his pet turtles with inspiring Game of Thrones. He's told several media outlets he has five or six of them in an aquarium with a tiny castle. He used to fantasize about the turtle kingdom and all of its wars. This became the foundation for the novels. Number 11. Martin has also suggested the wall is based on Hadrian's Wall of Roman Britain, effectively the northern border of the Roman Empire. Number 12. The Sopranos in Middle-earth is the tagline that showrunner David Benioff jokingly suggested for Game of Thrones, referring to its intrigue-filled plot and its dark tone combined with a fantasy setting that incorporates some magic and dragons. Number 13. The original pilot of the show has never been aired as it was considered an epic disaster. It's currently unavailable anywhere online. 90% of it was reshot by Tim Van Patten, who was, not coincidentally, a major directing force on The Sopranos. Number 14. Like the novels it adapts, Game of Thrones has a sprawling ensemble cast, estimated to be the largest on television. In the first season, there were around 20 principal characters, and by the time season 3 rolled around, 250 cast names were listed. Number 15. When casting Game of Thrones, Benioff and Weiss looked at up to 200 people for each role. Sean Bean and Peter Dinklage, however, were just straight up offered their roles. Producers never really considered others. Number 16. Sean Bean, who plays Ned Stark, was one of the very first actors cast, and the only actor considered for the role. For most viewers, he was the only recognizable face in the new series. The producers knew that and placed his mug all over the promotion. Number 17. Bean was best known in the States from his role as Boromir in Lord of the Rings and as James Bond 007's enemy Janice in Goldeneye. Number 18. Mark Addy was later cast as King Robert Baratheon. He was best known for his role in the 90s British comedy classic Full Monty. Number 19. The devilishly handsome Jamie Lannister, the finest sword in all of Westeros, is played by Danish actor Nikolai Kosterwaldo. Dragons and fantasy he was quoted as saying, I didn't think it was going anywhere. Little did he know he would be the most popular murderous, incestuous heartthrob in TV history. Number 20. Queen Cersei Lannister is played by Lena Headey, best known as Queen Gorgo from the film 300 and its sequel. She's awfully good at being queen, isn't she? Although both queens she portrays are very strong women, they couldn't be more different. Headey has claimed at her Cersei core is just fear and paranoia, and that's where she behaves from. And Gorgo doesn't come from that place at all. Gorgo's for the people. Number 21. 
Skeety is good friends with Peter Dinklage, who she has stated first pitched the role of Cersei Lannister to her. Number 22, Amelia Clark was cast as Mother of Dragons Daenerys Targaryen after the original disastrous pilot was trashed. On top of being fantastic in the role, Clark was named Esquire's Sexiest Woman Alive in 2015. Number 23, for some reason, Clark says she did the funky chicken and the robot dance during her audition. Any idea why? I sure don't. Number 24, Game of Thrones has actual ties to English history. Did you know Harry Lloyd, who played Daenerys' brother Viserys before he uh, received his crown of gold, shall we say, is actually the great-great-great-great-grandson of Charles Dickens, writer of literary classics, A Tale of Two Cities, and A Christmas Carol. Number 25, the production had just one chance to get Viserys' famous gold crown death scene because the gold paint would destroy his costume, made further complicated by the small smoke packs on his chest and back that had to release at the exact right time. They nailed it, and a horrifying, but awesome, death scene was on celluloid forever. Number 26, Kit Harington plays fan favorite the bastard Jon Snow, and this was his first television role ever. A recent drama grad, Harrington had only been in plays before landing the critical role. Number 27, the man we all know as Jon Snow almost chose a camera over the sword. Prior to becoming an actor, Kit had plans to become a war correspondent or a cameraman. We're certainly glad he had a change of heart. Number 28, Kit's unusual name may have hinted at his future in the arts. His mom named him after William Shakespeare. Well, she named him after Christopher Kit Marlowe, whom many believe was the real Shakespeare. Number 29, one more fascinating fact about Kit Harrington, his great-great-grandpa invented the toilet. Kit Harrington was a 16th century poet and inventor who conceived and built the first flushing toilet. Number 30, every bastard born in the North is given the surname Snow, hence John Snow. Bastards from Westeros' other kingdoms are given different surnames, Rivers in the Riverlands, Stone in the Vale, Hill in the Westerlands, Storm in the Stormlands, Sand in Dorne, Flowers in the Reach, Pike on the Iron Islands, and Waters in the areas surrounding King's Landing. Number 31. One more important fact for the newbies, the Faith of the Seven is actually a monotheistic religion, with each of the seven deities representing a part of the one same God. They are the Mother, the Maiden, the Crone, the father, the warrior, the smith, and the stranger, who represents death. Number 32, Sophie Turner, who plays Sansa Stark, got a B in drama. She had a tutor on the set of Game of Thrones until the age of 16. Number 33, Arya Stark was actress Macy Williams' first professional acting job. Her first love was actually dance, which explains her grace and speed in learning to use needle. Number 34, fans love Arya for her toughness and determination, but Macy Williams has plenty of her own. She's naturally right-handed, but learned to fight left-handed after learning from her parents that Arya is left-handed in the books. Number 35, Alfie Allen, who plays Theon, is the older brother of British singer-songwriter Lily Allen, who apparently was offered a role on Game of Thrones in later seasons as Theon's sister Tara, who he tries to seduce, which she quickly turned down for, uh, you know, obvious reasons. Number 36, hey, did you know that the Allens are also the third cousins of Stay With Me singer Sam Smith? There's too much talent in that family, that's not fair. Number 37, Bronn, the 80s pop star? Jerome Flynn, who plays the mercenary Bronn, was in the 90s doo-wop duo called Robson and Jerome. They had three number one singles in the UK. <laughs> Who would have thunk it? Number 38. Christian Nairn, who plays Hodor on the show, is actually a DJ, singer, guitarist, and performance artist. Wait, all that talent and they just make him say Hodor all the time? Number 39. The actor who plays Maester Eamon of the Night's Watch, Peter Vaughn, is legally blind in real life, just like the character he portrays on the show. Number 40. In the show, Jack Leeson plays the tyrannical young King Joffrey, one of the best villains in modern TV. In real life, however, Gleeson is known as a polite, talented leader, as a founder and artistic director of Collapsing Horse Theater Company, which is based in Dublin. Number 41. After the first episode aired, Gleason received a letter from George R. R. Martin that read, Congratulations! Everybody hates you! Gleason took it with stride, laughing about it in newspapers and on talk shows. Number 42. The Mighty Call Drago was played by Jason Momoa. Before Game of Thrones, he was best known for Stargate Atlantis, where he had epic dreads. Just look at those things. Number 43. So have you ever wondered about his gnarly scar? Back in 2008, Momoa was unfortunately slashed in the face with a broken beer glass by another customer at the Bird's Cafe, a Hollywood, California tavern. He received around 140 stitches during the reconstructive surgery. Number 44. Call Drago's powerful fight scene in which he kills a Dothraki named Mago was written at actor Jason Momoa's request. He thought showing Call Drago's strength would be more powerful than just hearing others talk about it. And he wanted to show off those muscles. Number 45. By the beard of Poseidon, Momoa is about to be Aquaman in the DC Universe. His first appearance will be in the Batman vs Superman Dawn of Justice film, followed by his own spin-off. Number 46. 
Fan favorite Tyrion is played by Peter Dinklage, best known for his breakout role in the indie film The Station Agent. Dinklage as Tyrion was so popular, in fact, that he was given top billing on the show going into season two. Number 47, Dinklage doesn't get the books? In 2014, he said on The Late Show with David Letterman that he had once tried to read the books the show is based upon, but got confused. He joked, George Martin, our author, is probably going to kill my character soon because I mentioned that. Number 48, fun fact, Dinklage also voiced the sexy wake-up guy on Seinfeld episode The Wink. Mind? Blown. Number 49. Before Game of Thrones, both Benioff and Weiss had only written for film. This resulted in several first season episodes being about 10 minutes too short for HBO, forcing them to write another 100 pages of scripts during the final two weeks of pre-production. Number 50. Because the show's budget could not be adjusted for these additional 100 pages, Benioff and Weiss had to set many of the scenes in a single room with only a couple actors speaking. Some of the best scenes came out of these 100 pages, including the brutally honest scene between Robert and Cersei Baratheon. Number 51. The producers initially considered shooting the whole series in Scotland, but eventually chose Northern Ireland because of the availability of studio space on top of just stunning scenery. Scotland didn't lose out entirely though. The legendary Dune Castle was used as Winterfell. Fun trivia, it was also the primary location in Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Number 52, Dune isn't entirely Winterfell. The courtyard of Winterfell is actually a parking lot, and the crypts under Winterfell are actually a wine cellar. Number 53, the first season's southern scenes were filmed in Malta, a change in location from the sets of Morocco used for the pilot episode. One of the many changes from the doomed original pilot. Number 54. The president of Malta lent the production his summer home, which became Master Lario's home. No one was let inside, but they were allowed to film on his patios and in his gardens, which doubled as the gardens for the Red Keep. Number 55. For the scene in Winter is Coming, in which Ned and company find a dead stag, the production used an actual dead stag. It had been dead for two days and apparently smelled like it too, so the actors' reactions were genuine. Number 56. The stag being skinned by Tywin Lannister in You Win or You Die was also a real stag, and also actually skinned by Tywin's actor Charles Dance. He learned how to do it earlier that day. It is a fantastic introduction to one of the most dangerous characters on the show. The stag is also the sigil of House Baratheon. Hmm, can you say foreshadowing? Number 57. While we're on the subject of real or fake, Lisa Stark is wearing a prosthetic front piece when she breastfeeds her terror of a son, the eight-year-old Robin. Number 58. Game of Thrones has won two Emmys and been nominated five times for best costumes. Their success comes from combining detailed mid evil period research with bold, outside-of-the-box ideas like... Number 59, some actors are dressed in fish scales. The show's costumes are inspired by many cultures, including ancient Japanese and Persian cultures. One wild example, Dothraki outfits resemble the Bedouins. One was made out of fish skins to resemble dragon scales, and then the wildlings wear animal skins inside out, just like the Inuits. Number 60, wildling bone armor is made of molds taken from real bones and assembled with string and latex resembling cat gut. It's a material used for the strings of some musical instruments, made from the dried, twisted intestines of sheep or horses. Number 61. Game of Thrones has a huge hair budget. About two dozen wigs are used for the actresses. Number 62. Made of human hair and up to two feet in length, they cost up to $7,000 each and are washed and styled just like real hair. Number 63. It takes some time to get Daenerys looking so good. Amelia Clark requires about two hours to style her brunette hair with a platinum blonde wig and braids to get her into that Mother of Dragons look. Number 64. For the large amount of visual effects in the series, HBO hired VFX teams in Great Britain and Ireland who specialize in something called 2.5D projection mapping. The basic idea is taking 2D images, like a photo, and through algorithms turning it into a 3D landscape. Number 65. Not all of the effects in Game of Thrones are high tech. The pool in Winterfell Godswood was filled with black paint so it would be as dark and reflective as possible. Number 66. The Westerosi characters of Game of Thrones speak British English, often but not always, with the accent of the English region whose geographic location location corresponds to the character's Westerosi region. For instance, Ned Stark as Warden of the North speaks in actor Sean Bean's native northern accent, while the southern Lord Tywin Lannister speaks with a southern accent. Number 67. Characters foreign to Westeros are often played with a non-British accent, and sometimes producers make up their whole own language. Linguist David J. Peterson was hired to develop the Dothraki and Valerian languages based on just a few words used in Martin's novels. Number 68. The Dothraki language has over 3,000 words. Number 69. The B BBC estimated that over the lifetime of the series, Game of Thrones fictional languages were heard by more people than the Welsh, Irish, Scots, and Gaelic languages combined. Number 70. 
Let's talk puppies! The direwolves on the first season of the show were played by northern Inuit dogs, dogs which were crossbred in the 80s in an attempt to create a domestic dog closely resembling a wolf. Number 71. The powerful, terrifying direwolves were so sweet that Sansa, Sophie Turner, adopted the dog who played her wolf in season 1. Aww. The dog's real name is Zoni and is now a minor social media star thanks to Sophie's pictures. Number 72. Direwolves are real! Well, they were real about 10,000 years ago and they weighed up to 175 pounds. <laughs> they must have been terrifying. Number 74. Peter Dinklage is a vegetarian. All the meat he eats on the show isn't real. It's tofu. He even narrated a PETA PSA about facing your food. Number 73. We may have found your next Valentine's Day gift for your significant other. The horse heart Daenerys ate for Khal Drago on the show was actually a three pound mass of gummy bear like substance. Watch those cavities, Khaleesi. Number 75. Amelia Clark admitted that she got literally stuck to a toilet seat when covered in fake blood while filming that sequence. Number 76. The severed head of George W. Bush appears in a couple scenes in the first season of the show. HBO was not pleased and issued an apology for what they called an unacceptable, disrespectful thing to do. Number 77. Blood Blood, guts, and gore run up plenty throughout Season 1 of Game of Thrones. In a 2012 study of deaths per episode, the series was listed second out of 40 recent US TV drama series with an average of 14 deaths per episode, making it one of the most violent shows in the history of TV. Number 78. Usually it's a good idea to fast forward through a show's title sequence, but not with Game of Thrones. The series title sequence was created by production studio Elastic for HBO and received the 2011 Emmy Award for Main Title Design. The sequence actually changes several times per season, highlighting different areas of the fictional world featured prominently in each episode. Number 79, this show, through its cast members, has countless ties to prominent historic English figures. Number 80, nudity and violence has been a trademark of the show since season one. But did you know the show was credited with inventing the phrase sex position, which basically means revealing important plot points of a story while tons of gratuitous sex is happening. Number 81, the stunning opening title sequence is filled with beautiful imagery and cool Easter eggs for the serious fans. If you look closely you'll see an astrolabe showing the complicated history of the throne and next to each actor's name is the symbol of the house their characters belong to in the show. Number 82. According to producer Greg Spence, there is a mad monk in the Westeros world who is famed for his textured maps of Westeros. This concept was the inspiration for the game-like three-dimensional images in the opening credits sequence. Number 83. The iconic opening score is composed by series composer Raman Jawadi, who previously composed the score for the first Iron Man. Number 84. The theme song is played on instruments that are medieval appropriate, dark, and rich. Violins, lutes, cellos, and even a chorus of 20 women to give it a gothic ethereal feel. For a deeper dive, check out a podcast called Song Exploder. Raman explains every layer of the song. Number 85. Benioff and Weiss actually banned Jawadi from using any flutes in his score, feeling they were too cliche. Number 86. Magister Illyrio owns paintings of cannons, which aren't used in the Game of Thrones universe. A crew member pointed this out to Weiss, who had the solution. Magic, of course. Number 87. The men-at-arms that Caitlin hired on the episode Cripples, Bastards, and Broken Things are named Larry's, Curlket, and Moar, after the Three Stooges. Number 88. Speaking of Cat Stark, she's played by Michelle Fairley, who appears in the Harry Potter films as Hermione Granger's mom. Number 89, the beloved character from the books Old Non disappears after her second episode because actor Margaret John sadly passed away. In the novels, she makes it a bit longer before being presumed dead. The episode Lord Snow is dedicated to her memory. Number 90, one of the amazing pieces of set design is the fabled Iron Throne. It took the props team two months to build it, and it takes four people to move and is over eight feet tall. Number 91, legend has it some iconic swords have found their way into the Iron Throne, including Orlando Bloom's from Kingdom of Heaven and Glamdring, Gandalf's sword from the Lord of the Rings. Number 92, in the books, the Iron Throne is enormous and made of a thousand swords. For the show, Benioff and Weiss wanted to look more realistic, so it's much smaller. They brilliantly explained this by having Littlefinger shatter the notion of a thousand swords by claiming it's less than 200 because he's counted personally. Number 93. Earlier we mentioned R plus L equals J, the extremely popular fan theory about Jon Snow's lineage. When Jon Snow is telling Sam about his mom, the letters RL can be seen on a wooden post nearby. Sneaky sneaky. Number 94. Before he receives his golden crown, if a series name drops a legendary dragon, Vermithrax, while he's trying to impress his prostitute. This is a reference to Vermithrax pejorative from the 1981 fantasy film Dragon Slayer, which Martin believes is the best dragon dragon ever put on film. Number 95, as Mr. Lewin explains to Bran during season one, many people think that the words of House Lannister
Lannister are, a Lannister always pays his debts. But that's just a popular saying about the family. The actual words of House Lannister are, hear me roar. Number 96. Martin has been quoted as saying that Game of Thrones is more of a response to Tolkien's Lord of the Rings than a tribute. Martin wanted to know what King Aragorn's tax policy was going to be, or whether or not he would keep a standing army. Instead of asking Tolkien, which is obviously impossible, he just wrote his own version. Number 97. The series premiere of Game of Thrones aired on HBO on April 17th, 2011, which was coincidentally Sean Bean's birthday. Number 98. In 2013, TV Guide named the execution of Ned Stark the second greatest twist of all time, just beyond the ending of the Twilight Zone episode to serve man. It would not be the last accolade for the show. Number 99, Game of Thrones emerged as a critically acclaimed hit with respectable viewership. The first season had an average of 2.5 million viewers on Sunday nights, but thanks to its incredible growth in popularity, each episode now has nearly four times as many people watching live every Sunday. Number 100, Game of Thrones was nominated for 13 2011 Emmy Awards including Outstanding Drama Series. It won two Emmys that year, one for Peter Dinklage's portrayal of Tyrion Lannister and one for that incredible opening title sequence. Number 101, Game of Thrones did more than just win awards, it inspired a new wave of baby names. In fact, more than 150 babies were named Khaleesi in 2012, and Arya is the fastest growing baby name in the United States. Number 102, Game of Thrones influenced the critics who cover the show as well. Critics Miles McNutt coined the term sex position to describe the scenes on Game of Thrones where characters feed the audience information against the backdrop of sex or nudity. It's a hallmark of adult television now. Number 103. Fans are so enamored with the show, online cookbooks have been made dedicated to the food on the show, and the series even has its own inspired blonde ale. Number 104. The show's impact stretches into the animal kingdom as well. Game of Thrones and Twilight are thought to be responsible for a huge increase in husky and malamute ownership. Rescue organizations say, however, that many owners aren't prepared for the amount of time and attention these breeds require. Number 105. The novels and now the show have gained some famous fans at all levels of influence. President Barack Obama, British Prime Minister David Cameron, and former Australian Prime Minister Julia Gillard have all pledged their love of Westeros. Number 106. Even the Dutch Foreign Minister Franz Timmermans is swept up in Game of Thrones. He's quoted the novels extensively in a speech titled, What Can We Learn From Game of Thrones? Number 107. Do not ask George R. R. Martin what happens if he dies. It drives him nuts. For the record, once and for all, yes, Martin has told Benny off and Weiss how the story ends just in case of his untimely demise, and they are the only two people who know other than Martin. So don't worry, fellow super fans, we're covered. Thanks for watching Cinematica's 107 Facts You Should Know About Game of Thrones Season 1. Like what you just saw? Well, we've got more 107 Facts coming out next week. And if you love obsessing over movies and TV, be sure to tell your friends. Like this video and subscribe to Cinematica, where we help you watch smarter.